So, Jonathan, obviously this has been an inflection point year, a catalytic year in many ways. I want to lean on your expertise in the world of media to start because it feels like something meaningful has happened. Something has accelerated. Do you agree with that? And what has happened to the world of media here in 2020? Okay. Well, um, it, pandemic and acceleration should definitely go together, whether we're talking about media, norms, politics, social issues. Uh, COVID tends to accelerate pre-existing trends. So if we had the perspective of 10 years from now, looking back, you would see a change in the rate of growth in some spaces and decline in another, an inflection point. Uh, and by the way, I think some changes that we're seeing in pan that will come closer to where we were before. So for example, uh, streaming, everyone likes to talk about streaming. We've seen those numbers uh, increase. Uh, linear TV was always on a de decline. It's, it's, it's death, although I don't think it'll happen as fast as predicted, um, was really just about a debate about decay rate, not what will happen. Um, I don't think, for example, uh, uh, Quibi that didn't make it in a short period of time as a new streamer was a consequence of the pandemic, for example. I think it would not have made it in any environment. By the way, hats off. Um, uh, uh, to, to those entrepreneurs and investors that took a bold move and try and compete with existing streamers. Um, I just think in this, it, it just wasn't compelling and the markets spoke and they were smart to recognize that. Um, but in streaming to say that Netflix has advantage, they already were. I really think coming into the, the, this year, Netflix had won. Uh, it was a question of to what degree, what moves they make along the way. Uh, the more interesting question is what happens after that. Disney, we saw, came on like gangbusters, but they had advantages that others didn't have, principally in content. Um, and that their content creators, not just their library and their franchises, but their culture, huge advantage. Uh, uh, Comcast, so, that's a surprise. It, okay, so so tell me about that because there were some surprises. You know, as you say, people were betting on Netflix. No one was shocked at, at Disney, but th there were some surprises. So tell yeah. me what you saw. Uh, I think Peacock will surprise people. Um, they have, it. when some names, Netflix is pretty simple. That's just Netflix. Peacock is Comcast. It's a very important distinction. They have incredible uh, content through NBC and Universal. They have always been in the content aggregation business as an MVPD. That's a huge help. Um, so they're both a network manager and a very good one. And I would say considerable heft and talent on content creation, huge advantage. I think that will surprise folks. Um, HBO. HBO could surprise, I think it was a very smart move to bring Jason on. I'm biased, we were partners, we started Hulu together. So of course, um, uh, you know, I would, I would bet on him. Um, it's not easy, it just depends on the content they create. I think after that, they'll make the right moves. They tell the right stories, package it that right, right way, they have good leadership. Even though they're trapped inside what is really a network company which is not an advantage. Right. Uh, but give Jason autonomy, I think um, that works. So the big four that I just mentioned, I think they're in good position. Amazon and Apple for different, uh, look, Amazon can always hang in there. Sure. You know, this is a, whatever they spend on content, which is less than all the others I just mentioned, th they could triple it overnight and it would be the equivalent of a marketing spend for Amazon Prime, doesn't matter. Well, and it's funny you say that, and I think you and I have talked about this before. I mean, I'm always going to have Amazon Prime because, or Prime Video, because I'm always going to have Amazon Prime. I don't imagine a world where, where I won't have that. So presumably, that's a huge advantage for Amazon. Huge. Because, it, you know, for, contrast that with Disney. 
gives me, gives me at some point soon, it will be about earnings. It's kind of bifurcated now. They have earnings and then they have this enormous growth opportunity in streaming. Um, Netflix will make that pivot when grow, trees don't grow to the sky. So it won't be just a growth story. Um, it'll be a profitability story. Um, Amazon, I can't imagine streaming will be a P&L consideration for them as a standalone unit because right. it contributes to something much greater. That's a problem for everyone. There's probably not an industry. I, I, we happen to care about media and, and other select verticals. But my guess is that there are very few verticals that aren't uh, casting a watchful eye on Amazon because of their scale and, and prowess. And, and, and so as you look to 21, and, and I think we all come into every day more and more hopeful that soon this pandemic will be behind us. We know we have a few uh, rough months ahead, it, it feels like. But if you're a media investor, and you are, where do you look at in 21, given everything that happened in 20? Well, first of all, to be clear, we're not public equity investors, except occasionally um, at the um, tail end of the, right. in, in one of our portfolio companies, as a, as a portfolio company, not as a company. Um, and so we have lots, of, we have a much easier task than public equity investors. A, because we can do almost anything we want that's lawful. Uh, in creating companies. And that's how we spend our time building businesses, like Hulu that I mentioned. Um, so we have a much greater latitude than, than public companies and even public company investors because they typically need a certain scale already, you know, depending on the size of the funds under management. Um, we have degrees of freedom they don't have. In fact, what we tend to do is operate by uh, weaving in around the legs of big guys and build a business that hopefully they're gonna to wanna to buy. Um, and we've had experience with that. Uh, so it's, um, I think the task for public equity investors generally is, is difficult right now, obviously with interest rates near zero, it's gotta be about growth. Right. Future cash flows are valued at nearly the same as current cash flows. So, growth has never been, has never had a higher multiple. Right. So as you think about being a private investor, you know, over the past few years, you and I have talked a lot about both the media landscape, but also the fitness landscape where you invested in Ironman, the live experience uh, landscape where you've invested in theaters. We will get back to that world eventually. So how do you position yourself as a private investor in 21 to, to maybe take advantage of some trends that were arrested, but presumably you still believe in? Yeah, so we, we have been, um big for many years on live, uh, you know, live content. And most content, by the way, is not. It, you know, it's scripted, it's recorded, it's produced and released sometimes a year later. Uh, so, but live, I'd say number one on that list is sports. Um, and yes, we, you know, from Major League Soccer to Top Golf now, um, uh, to a, a Iron Man that you mentioned, yes, we're, uh, we still like live. We still really like sports um, and business ambassador theater group that we own, which is the largest, largest theater company. I don't mean theatrical exhibitor. I mean, actors on a stage. Absolute. What, what was that hurt by COVID? No question about it. Will that come back? I believe absolutely. I mean, it's one of the oldest forms of entertainment and can't be disintermediated by technology. Actually, one of the interesting things about what's happening in the media landscape, it's not about technology for change. It's, it, it's about human behavior. It's, it, because if you think about all the things we're doing, even streaming, that technology we've had now had for years, it's about bandwidth and ubiquity of networks. That's not different. How people choose to watch how they want to program for themselves instead of having a network program for them, i.e. linear, that's the big difference. So I, I see all of that resuming sports. I'm unshaken in uh, belief in the growth and hence value of sports. 
I read about, you know, our NFL ratings, which is, you know, that's the gold standard in the US. I mean, I love NBA and NHL and you can go down the list, but it, by value, it's the most, uh, it's top of the food chain. And when I hear that ratings are off, you know, I, I, first of all, I think their ratings are pretty good. If you look at the top 30 shows in the U.S. this year, 90% of them are NFL games. Right. You always see some um, hit in an election cycle. So we're seeing that. But gosh, when they started this year, you had four leagues that were on the air. Two of them were in playoff games. So that's going to, you know, steal some share. Uh, but actually, relative to all sports, they increased. If it was down 6%, that's not a big deal. There were no fans there, no preseason buildup. Actually, here's what I, what I think. Some things are COVID, some things are not. People respond, fans, in the case of sports, respond to quality of product more than anything. So as we learned a few years ago in the NFL, if you did, well, actually the last election cycle, a lot of that was blamed on election. I think some of it was just, they were great, games weren't great. So when you see the NFC, uh, I'm sorry, AFC East is just not great. You lose some markets because the teams aren't, you're in New York. I don't know if you're a Jets fan or Giants fan. But it, it's just not great. Um, even Pats. I'm a, long, is, I'm a long-suffering Atlanta Falcons fan for the record. So oh, okay. I, I've, I've, got, I've got a whole host of other issues, Jonathan. So uh, I'm a Pats fan. I don't know if people will turn out or tune in when they say <laughs> That's that. That's right. Um, but... And yes, I love the, the uh, current, current ownership and what they've done over the last couple of de decades. But because I was born in Providence, Rhode Island, of course, I'm a Pats fan. Of course. So, and this is not a strong year for them, for the first time in the world, and they've spoiled us. Um, so that, that's not helpful. It's also not helpful when uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are blown out against the Saints and the first half the game is over, whatever it was, 31 to 3. I, it was a block. Those are the things that actually matter. NFL has a great product. And when the games, the icing on the cake is when they flex into better games, that help, that's where ratings go up or down. But overall, I think their ratings are solid. I really do. Under the circumstances, when there are no fans in the stadium and no preseason and competition with news channels like yours that have Zoomed, or maybe that's the wrong word because it's confusing, exploded yeah. um, this election cycle because it was crazy. I think it's pretty good. I think sports has done well. And so let me press you a minute on sports, though, because from a content perspective, is that the sort of investable side? Is it the media side? Is it the content side of sports that becomes attractive to you as a private investor? So as a, what we look for are typically services around um, whether it's sports or live entertainment. Um, I can give you examples. So for uh, practically every um, artist, musical artist on tour, they, before they go on tour, they need to uh, conceive, uh, uh, build, engineer, uh, complicated, sophisticated sets, e e bigger than the one you're sitting in right now. Actually, I imagine yours is not very big, but it's full of high tech. So imagine uh, a touring band. That all goes through a company called Tate. We own it. It's a, um, um, we have a business. We decided a long time ago, okay, digital advertising, hot growing space, except that's really Facebook and Google and Amazon control it. We do not want to compete with them. We want to be their partners. And we've done that. Double Verify, which does brand safety for uh, digital advertising, where we work with Facebook and Google. Uh, the same could be uh, said for other businesses we're in. Those are examples. So I think content is a great place to be. I would tell folks that are, are drawn to content, most of us are, and you know, in our youth, if you're not then, forget it. Um, but if you are, go with the mainstream, go where the money is. Yeah. I mean, the amount of money that is being spent now replacing, uh, you know, the traditional media spend is eye-popping. Will it be sustained? I don't know, but it's going to go on for uh, 
plenty to start a career. So that's where I would go if I were thinking about, if I were much younger. Yeah. So let me ask you this. In terms of, you know, you talked about the depth of linear, the explosion of streaming. Have we fundamentally changed as consumers when it comes to what we expect in terms of both the production and the consumption and the availability of media and content? Yeah, so I, look, I've, there are two points. One is we tend to think in, in any period like this, and, and I don't mean just the pandemic, because I think most of this would have happened anyway. Yes, we had a blip and some trends were accelerated up and down. But media has been about upheaval and change for 50 years, easily, probably 60 or 70. And in the moment, we always thought it was amazing. Believe me, when we went from radio to TV, a lot of minds were blown by that. When we went from black and white to color, people went like, this is unbelievable. Okay, so we're, we're, what, what do we see now? We see high quality. I mean, that's the most, uh, to me, the dominant theme when you're watching something on uh, basically an aggregator that didn't even exist years ago, you're bl I'm blown away by the quality. We now just expect it. That's a big change. Um, we also expect to get it whenever we want, right. however we want, wherever we are. That's a big change. In other words, the consumer, the one, the one constant is the consumer gets, I think, all things considered, and it's not just price, it's the product, it's the service, more and more. It's better and better. It's inexorable that it's a better consumer experience, you know, throughout all these, quote, upheavals, all these changes, whether it was inspired by uh, law, that is, uh, or technology or consumer behavior. It was some combination of those. Right. All right. So speaking of changes, I, I want to wrap up by asking you about a pretty major change in, in your life and your firm's life, which is the announcement that you will essentially, you have put into place a, a, a succession plan at the firm that, that you founded. Yeah. Tell me about that decision, what the pandemic did to potentially accelerate it or the role that it had and, and what it means because you and I both know, you better than I, that succession in private equity is a, is a rare and tricky thing. And so I wonder, you know, what yeah. you have observed through that. Yeah, well, I, I really wanted to get it right. It's been on my mind, I think, especially since everyone said, oh, he'll never retire. He'll do this forever, which I hate hearing, you know, what I, will, I, I don't want to be that predictable. Um, and there aren't many good examples uh, of, of transitions in our space. And I do have peers that have been doing this a long time. They're uh, uh, was showing no signs of, of, of uh, withdrawing. And so I thought, well, at some point I should, and I'd rather not do it based on a health reason or something outside of my control. In other words, when we're doing really well. Um, and I've been thinking about it for a couple of years. Uh, because I thought along with success, which Providence has had many successes, um, surviving a founder should be one of them, an important one. Um, and that was my goal. So I wanted to do it when things were going well, when I started to think about, is there something else I would want to do? Now, for the record, um, I've committed to stay another four years uh, at a minimum. And I'm having a ton of fun. My wife said, this change that was announced, I see no change at home. By the way, of course, I'm working from home. Right. You are working if I, at least as hard as you always did. And the only thing I can't measure is travel because no one's traveling. But you sit in a chair all day long on the phone, as we are, you and I, right now, though this is, you know, on the enjoyable scale at the higher end. Uh, that's what you do. Well, for me, it's less of the day to day. I can focus on investing, which is the piece I like most. I have really experienced, talented partners who I think will be great culture carriers. And that was critical. And as I said, we're doing well. So COVID, the truth is that COVID probably accelerated the change. Yes, some long walks on an island that I live on got me thinking about how to spend the rest of my life. 
yes, that's true. But I'd been thinking about before. So it didn't affect the outcome. It probably advanced the timing. Um, yes. So let me just ask you this, sort of, sort of to synthesize it all. As you look at the landscape, both in terms of your own firm, your own choices, but also the media landscape, the consumer landscape, if you had to put a number on the accelerant of the past year, it, did it accelerate generally things to twice as fast, five times as fast? I know that the answer varies, but I do wonder, as someone who has to measure things, how you measure the acceleration in, in either to the positive or, or to the negative, depending on where you look. Yeah, it's interesting. If you're uh, just judging it inside this period, I think you will tend to exaggerate the effects of, of the pandemic, not just in media, but all over. What we really need, and I think what matters most are the long-term effects, which is hard for most people to think beyond this week, next month, this election cycle, what, um, so most of what we're seeing would have happened anyway. Mm. I really believe that. I think, and that's probably true in other, you know, business travel, did it really make sense? No, not, not a lot of it. Did this, you know, pandemic prove that? Absolutely. How many of us are gonna get on a plane to go halfway around the world for a meeting? I don't think I will be, I'm sorry to say for those that I used to do that with. <laughs> But in person still matters. Live still matters. It still matters, even though people are watching sports in, um, in you know, by the millions, uh, and and very close to what we were watching before. Um, you know, within five percent, and that's without fans. Fans will be back, and it'll improve the experience. They will go back. That's what I think. So, um, no, I think. The trends that are the most valuable are enduring ones. We hit, you know, we'll be able to spot this pandemic, at, you know, in historians, and I don't mean just, um, you know, virologists look back at this. Um, there was some inflection point, but it was part of something else. Now, it will alter our mind about, you know, you know how, you know, next time I see you in person, do I shake your hand? Do I not? What those kind of things? Yeah. You know, that's okay. I think for what really drives us, we we love the engagement. Um, the things that we used to love, I think we still will. Uh, so I'm 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 really looking forward to wide adoption of effective vaccines, and to proving that comment that uh, you know many habits will resume. Okay, with uh, enduring effects, but in the main, think of, we talked about sports. I don't yeah. think you're going to see a new sport. I don't think you're going to see a reshuffling in that hierarchy. I don't think you're going to see streaming um, fall off because people aren't consuming as much. Actually, people are consuming about the same anyway. Um, will they go back? To the news explosion wasn't was partly pandemic, but mostly, honestly, craziness um, with, um, you know, uh, the politics, let's say. Right. Right. Um, that, and by the way, to answer your question on, on, on news, we will get off this, if there was a Richter scale for nuttiness, for breaking norms, we're pinned at 10 right now for how folks like you, and I don't mean you, interview, and you've been very kind to me over the years, but I'm talking about political candidates when they say, no, you're a liar. I think we never used to say that. Never heard right. that on, on news. Now you hear it every day. I think with the president-elect, we will go back something closer to what we experienced, but not the same. That's probably a really good example. You won't see that antagonistic, just blatant, um, you know, fist bashing. But I think you'll see more cutting to the chase and a little more, you know, pushback than we saw, you know, in years past. 